First Assembly of God in Giddings, Texas has been supporting the Texas A&M uh, Chi Alpha organization for 20 years, 30 years, John? 30 years? 30 years. She wasn't born when First Assembly of God started supporting Chi Alpha. And McKenna Norman is an appointed Chi Alpha missionary associate. And uh, I want you to take a moment and introduce and tell them stuff and you know, get, get ready to preach the word and then preach the word and then bring us to prayer. Um, here's my favorite part of my McKenna story. Guys, you know that sometimes I forget stuff. And uh, Diane and I were in H-E-B, how long ago was that? Was that three months, four months, five months? I don't know, I lost track. Okay, December, right in the thick of COVID, all right? And we're in H-E-B in College Station, and all of a sudden, I'm looking at bacon, and I hear, Pastor Pat! Pastor Pat! Except she's wearing a mask, and I turn around, and I look, and I... You know, all I can see is her eyes, and her eyes were smiling, but, you know, it's kind of hard to see that. And I hadn't, didn't have a clue who she was. He said, who's asking? I was like, Pastor Pat. He's like, who's asking? <laughs> who's asking? And she finally took the mask down. I'm McKenna Norman. And my favorite part of this story, it was in October. It was a fall one. Did we do a fall one? Mm -hmm. See, I lose track. I forget stuff. So we did that in October, and then it was November this story came about. So in October... Ryan, is that true? It was the Acts of the Apostles class for DSOM. Oh, I was thinking it was a spring break. Mm -hmm. See, I forget stuff. Acts of Apostles class. I was teaching the book of Acts. That's what I was doing? Yeah. I was teaching the book of Acts. <laughs> and I taught on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she didn't get baptized in the Holy Spirit then. But when I saw her at HEB, she said, Pastor Pat! I went, yay. Get introduced. God bless you. Have fun. Preach and bring us to prayer. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that story is true. And um, something that I love about Pastor Pat and Pastor Diane is they love, like, raising up a new generation of people that love God and are seeing the kingdom of God move forward. And so they are committed to that. And so that's what Pastor Pat was committed to when he was teaching the Acts of the Apostles class, making sure that I was empowered in every way to walk with Jesus. And so, um, yeah, I just want to thank Pastor Pat and Pastor Diane for allowing me to be here and to preach the word. And I'm excited. I'm super excited to be here. So, um, yeah, like, like Pastor Pat said, I'm McKenna Norman, and I am a Chi Alpha Campus Missionary Associate. <laughs> and so I, at Texas A&M University. And so I was a part of Chi Alpha my entire time while I was a student. And Chi Alpha is where I really learned how to take responsibility for other people's walks with God. I had grown up in an AG church my whole life. And, but in college, that's where I really learned that I could like, not only did, was I responsible for my walk with God, but I was responsible for other people's walk with God. And I could make sure that they were walking with him in every way that they could be. And so um, I love Chi Alpha. I have a picture of my small group. Um, yes, there we go. Okay, so that is my small group from this year. And small group is the heart and soul of Chi Alpha. It is what we like live and breathe. And so we go out on campus and we meet people and we share the gospel and we pray that the Lord would touch their heart. And so these are the girls that were in my small group for the spring semester. And the girl on the left, her name's Holly, and she'll be leading a small group in the fall. And... Um, so I love small group. That's where I was discipled, and that's where these girls are being discipled. And so um, I loved my time in college, part of Chi Alpha, so much that I decided to be on staff. And so now I've been on staff for one year, and I'm moving into my second year on staff. And um, I'm really excited. And one of the, I guess, privileges of being on staff with the Chi Alpha is you get to take a team overseas in the summer. And so that's the pictures you just saw. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and so this is the team I took to Tajikistan. I don't know if you've ever heard of Tajikistan. Um, I hadn't before I had gone, so no worries. But it's a small country that's above Afghanistan and to the left of China. And so it seems like it's in the thick of some pretty scary stuff, but it's really not. It was really quite a wonderful country. And it's a small country of about 8 million people. And the majority of the country is very like um, rustic and primitive and they're lost. They're very, very lost. They don't know the Lord. And they're 98% Muslim, but the remaining 2% isn't evangelical. It's like a mixture of 
Buddhist, Hindus, and agnostics. There's about, um, the missionary said there's about 1,500 evangelicals that they know of um, in the country. And so to, what happened in Tajikistan so impacted my heart that, and well, another girl has already committed to going back next year. So the Lord moved, and what happened there so impacted my heart that I arranged a whole sermon around it. I was going to come here, and I was going to preach about what God did in Tajikistan. But then on Wednesday, as I was thinking and just sitting in my car, actually, I was just thinking the Lord gave me something different. And so I am not preaching on anything about Tajikistan, but I'm excited because I know that the Lord gave me a word that's just for you guys. And so I'm really excited to share it. And um, yeah, so it's a, it's a privilege to be here and to get to share what's on my heart from the Lord. And so um, I'm just going to open us in prayer. Uh, Dear Jesus, we're just so grateful that we get to meet with you this morning and that we get to hear from you, God, and we know that you speak to us, Jesus. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would anoint my words and that you would help me to think clearly, God, and that, Lord, you would begin to stir hearts and speak what you want to speak, Jesus. And so we trust you and we trust your leading. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, before I get into this next story, I'm taking a sip of water. <laughs> okay, I've always seen pastors do that on stage. It didn't feel as classy as they look. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to just move on. Um, <laughs> but so back to Tajikistan. I have another picture up here of, from our time in Tajikistan. I'm going to tell a quick story. But so I grew up in inner city Dallas. I was surrounded by concrete and a bunch of cars and a whole lot of people. And so Tajikistan is not like that. If you go to Dushanbe, it's a little more modern. But when you go on a mission trip, you think, how can I serve the missionaries and how can I serve the people that were going, the, like the locals, the natives? How can I serve them and love them and show them that Jesus like, cares for them? And so we're in, we have that mindset and we're like, we will do whatever the missionaries ask. Like, you don't even have to worry about it. Like, we're going to do it and we're not going to complain. And so about our third week there, or it's the end of our second week, they start to tell us, they're like, okay, you're going to go to a very, very remote village in Tajikistan and we're going to go and we're going to work in the fields. I was like, work in the fields? I have never used a farm tool in my life, but I was like, okay. And so we go and we're getting ready to work in the fields. And well, first we get to the village and there's no plumbing, no water. You go to the restroom in a pretty gnarly hole and it, there's flies everywhere. It's hot. It is so hot. And as you can tell, I don't know if you can tell from there, but I'm on the right and half the dress is dark blue and the other half is light blue. It's because it was sweaty. And so we get there and we're working and we're all like, what is happening? They give us like a one minute introduction of like, this is how you use a sickle. And I was like, what is a sickle? And they're like leaning down and they're like showing us and they're like, okay, this is what you're gonna do. And so we're with a Muslim family right now. And the way that we could serve them was by working in their fields. And so we're ready to do it. Like no one's said a word. We're not complaining, we're excited. We're like, okay, let's see what farm work is like. And <laughs> so we're getting ready and we're just starting to work. And I remember the first like 30 minutes of us working, we're drenched in sweat, we're like covered in corn debris, and it's, it's just crazy. And I just remember the team is laughing, not because we're like, I don't know, I don't know what it was, just the Holy Spirit, but we're just like laughing. We're like, how did we end up here? And we're just like giggling and laughing at one another to the corn, but we're still like working hard. And I remember I started like looking out, and you can kind of see in the picture, there's like a mountain to the left, and it, the picture goes all the way, but there was like the sun was setting and I'm looking at the sunset over this like beautiful mountain range and we're just like laughing that how did we end up in a small country just above Afghanistan harvesting corn? How did this happen? And I just started to think about the Lord and I was like, God, like who must you be for me to have joyfully come all this way for the sake of the gospel? Like how much must like God's character and God like God himself be worth being here because I didn't want to leave I didn't want to go I wanted to be there and I was like God who must you be for me to want to be here and the feeling that I was feeling in towards towards in my heart towards him that I was like man God you're worth being here for you're worth learning how to use a sickle for the feeling that I was feeling was wonder I was in wonder of God of being like God like you are so like like worthy of being followed like all the way to somewhere I never would have thought and it didn't make being there hard. Like being there could have been way worse if I wasn't there for God. I'm like, but the Lord like, had done something in my heart, had captivated me so much that people were so important that I would go all that way for, for him. And I've learned a lot about wonder in college and um, this last year, especially working with Texanum Kyalfa. 
and I feel like my time overseas really just solidified everything in my heart. And wonder is very like childlike, but not childlike in immaturity, but childlike in innocence. It's like the innocence in the way you look at God and the way you see who he is. And it's comparable to awe is another way. And it's just trusting, it's trusting to who it's towards. And so um, the first thing that I've learned about wonder as I've been just like asking the Lord what it means is that wonder is always directed towards the character of God. And so wonder is directed towards the character of God. And so I have a few stories that accompany the following points that I'm gonna have about wonder. I have a few stories, but what I want us to understand is that wonder isn't about what, what God has done or what he's given us because that all flows from who he is. So wonder is directed towards who he is because everything that he does flows from that. And so when we're in wonder of God, we're in wonder of his character. And so Romans 2, 4 says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The goodness of God leads you to repentance. And so God's character calls a response from us. It brings about a response. When you learn more about his character, you can't remain neutral. It it brings a response. And his character is meant to draw us into further love of him, further wonder of who he is. And the more we learn about God, the more we should love him. And the more I read the Bible um, and kind of get to know God of the Bible, I learn that, like, or I realize that God is innocent and we are not. Like God is innocent and we, it is us who has hurt him, but it's God who still wants a relationship with us. So even though we've hurt him, he still wants to be in relationship with us. He still wants to know you and he still wants you to know him. And his character is long suffering and kind and full of mercy and he's trustworthy and faithful. And sometimes I think most importantly, he has a high view of who you are. He has a high view of man, which is why it's worth going all the way to Tajikistan for the sake of the gospel, because those people are important to God, and you're important to God. And so when you read the Bible and you learn all this about who God is, it's hard not to be in awe of him. It's hard not to be full of wonder that, like, I have hurt God, and yet he still has extended a hand of friendship towards me. And when I realize all that, I'm full of wonder towards him, towards who he is. And another thing that I've learned about wonder is it's possible to read the Bible and still miss who God is. And usually that's a result of an attitude in your heart towards God, because you can read something about him and be like, "Mm," you know, and not be about it. (laughs) But if you read the Bible with one, with humility, but also with gratitude, you'll really see who God is. And so the second point is that wonder starts with gratitude. Wonder starts with gratitude towards God. In Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Therefore, let us be grateful, and thus let us offer. Thus means is a result or a consequence of. So it starts with gratitude, and then a consequence of that gratitude is reverence and awe, awe being comparable to wonder. And so we have this saying in Chi Alpha, Um, that the first step away from God is ingratitude. And so if that's true, then that must mean that that the first step back towards God is gratitude. That if you're thankful for what you have and what he's given you, it always brings you back to the Lord. It always makes you think about him more. And if you think about God or even the world or you see a sunset, a really beautiful sunset or you have the birth of a child and it doesn't spark wonder in your heart, maybe just start by thanking God for giving it to you by saying, thank you, Lord, that you've given this to me, that I have a house, that I have a family, that I have all this. And I really believe that will begin to spark wonder in your heart that God would provide such a wonderful thing for you. And so when the Lord gave me this message on Wednesday, I was in my car driving back from the dealership. I had just gotten an oil change and I've been driving. The reason I was at the dealership is because my parents gifted me this brand new car and the first oil change came free. And so... I had been driving this kind of funny car before. It was like a Volvo. I loved it. I was going to drive that thing until it died. I was going to drive it. And it was starting to die, but I was in denial. And it was, it was like flooding in the driver's side anytime it would rain. And so you like get in the car and you like are underwater sort of. Um, and then the radio didn't work. The air conditioning didn't really work. The check engine light was just on no matter what you did. Um, but I was like, God, 
I don't really like the idea of buying a car. <laughs> I was like, that seems a little scary. I was like, but Lord, um, I'm gonna drive this car until you make a way for me not to. And I believe it's gonna work until I don't need to drive it anymore. And so I just begin to prepare in my heart that the Lord would help me with my finances to buy a new car. Not, well, not new, new, but like just like a new to me car. And I was just thinking that and I was like, okay, God, like you're gonna take care of it. And then I didn't think about it again. I was like, when the time comes for me to think about it again, you'll put it back in my mind. And so I let it go. And then like a month after that, my parents surprised me with this new car, this brand new car. The Lord made, them, made a way for them to give it to me. And so they gave it to me and I just couldn't believe it. I just have been in awe ever since. And so that was a couple months ago, but I'm sitting in the car and I'm just, again, I was just in shock. It is a beautiful little car. And so I was just driving it and I couldn't believe it. And I was just like, Lord, thank you for this car, this car that works and it doesn't flood and all the wonder, and it plays music on the radio. I was like, this is so cool. And I'm just sitting there so grateful that not only did God take care of something that I needed, but he did it so lavishly. He did it so lavishly. He didn't have to do it that way, but he did. And so I'm sitting there so grateful for what God has given me. And I begin to think like, God, you not only care about what I need, but you cared about what I wanted because he cares about the things deep in my heart. And never once have I lacked when walking with the Lord. And so I love what you're talking about for the, for the offering because it's true. When you're obedient to the Lord, when you're walking with God, never once will you lack. And so I'm just in awe that, that God is a provider, that he cares for us and he takes care of what we need and what we want. And so Pastor Pat told me that the series you're in right now is called When Religion Gets Personal. And I've been kind of thinking about it for the past, I guess, 30 minutes since he told me. And this next point kind of makes me think about it when religion gets personal. Because when you're in wonder of somebody, when you're in awe of somebody, it brings about a closer relationship. It gets closer to your heart. And so something about wonder is that wonder brings intimacy. And so when it brings intimacy into, between, in your relationship between you and God, that makes your relationship personal. When you're intimate with someone, it's personal with you. And so kind of cool that that kind of goes and so but so thank you Jesus um but wonder brings intimacy it brings closeness between you and God and I mean even think about um like someone you love when you love them and you think about them and you care about what they want and need when you're with them like it brings intimacy because you're like wow like you are amazing <laughs> and then it brings intimacy and so Jeremiah 33 3 says Call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. And the f fact that the God of the universe speaks directly to us is wild. That he will speak directly to you. That you're not dependent on me or dependent on Pastor Pat, but God will speak to you. You alone in your own relationship with God. And God wants a personal relationship with each one of you. No matter what we've done, no matter what happened, we can always come back to God because he wants to be in relationship with you. And it's cool because not only do we share our heart with him, but he shares his heart with us. He will tell us great and hidden things that we have not known. Like he will share with us what's in his heart. And what a promise that God will speak to us. What a promise that is that God will speak to you. And how much must God care for you for that to be true? Like how highly must he see you for him to be like, I'm gonna speak directly to you that you don't need like a pastor or a missionary or anyone. They're a great tool, that's true. I'm like, but you don't need them because God wants to speak just to you. And so that's really special. And so this, <laughs> so something that I'm learning about God is the more intimate our relationship with God is that he's a real friend, that he's a real friend to my heart. And a friend cares about what you care about. They see the things that you love. And sometimes when you're at the store and you see something your friend would love, you get it and you like think about it. And so... The next story I'm gonna tell is kind of silly, but, <laughs> but the Lord takes things that we find silly really seriously. And I should have brought it as a prop, but you'll see why. Um, so I was in Ross looking for a dress for this morning. And I was like, okay, God, if any of you ladies have been dress shopping, you know it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, so I said a prayer when I walked in. I was like, God, will you provide a dress for me? Because I need one. And so I just, I go up to the back rack. I'm like looking at a dress and I find one. I try it on. And I'm like, this is the dress. I was like, perfect. So I got, grab it and I take it. And oddly enough, God told me, he was like, that's not all I want you to buy today. And I was like, what? Are you sure? Like, 
I've, I've spent a lot of money. You've never told me that before. Um, <laughs> but no, he like goes, that's not all I want you to buy today. And I was like, okay. And so I was like, well, what do you want me to buy? And nothing. And I was like, okay, so I'm just going to look around. And so I walked to the shoes because I'm like, maybe he has some cool shoes he wants me to wear with this dress. And I look around. I don't really see anything that I would want to buy. I was like, okay. So, and I'm kind of standing there and I didn't want to buy anything else. There wasn't anything else I had in mind. And so I was just like standing there looking and I see this like perfume stand far away. And I'm not a huge perfume girl. Um, I mean, like I'll wear it, but I don't think about it that much. And so I was like, maybe I'll go look over there, which is super unusual for me. And so a little backstory, when my sister was in, she's here now, elementary school? I think it was elementary school. When my sister was in elementary school, my mom gifted her this glass bottle of Vera Wang princess perfume. It was heart-shaped. It had a little crown on top. It was beautiful, and it smells amazing. And so because my sister was so young and it just was a special gift from my mom, she has treasured that for, I think, about 10 years, a long time. This bottle has been on display in her bedroom for as long as I can remember. And... She has treasured this little glass bottle of Vera Wang Princess Perfume. She's used it sparingly because she was like, I can't find it anywhere else, so I'm going to use it sparingly. And even now, it's in her room with like this much perfume in it because she refuses to get rid of it. And so she, and she's looked. And when she got to high school, she started looking everywhere for this perfume. She was like, I need to get more of this perfume. It's my favorite. And so she's looking and looking and looking, and she can't find it anywhere. It's discontinued. This perfume is discontinued. And so she's like devastated, obviously. And she's like, this perfume that I treasure so much, is I can't find it anywhere. It's gone. And so she kind of gives up and doesn't think about it much more. And so flash forward to me at Ross. I'm at Ross, and I walk towards the perfume, and the first thing I see is a perfectly packaged, 60% off bottle of Vera Wang Princess Perfume. <laughs> And I see it, and I'm like, no way, Mally would love this. And I grab it, and I send her a picture, and I'm like, Mally, look what I found at Ross. And she texts me back in all caps and says, buy it, buy it, buy it. I've been looking for that everywhere. Super excited, obviously. And I was like, cool, this is so exciting. And so I buy it, and I take it to my house, and because she was in Austin, and I take it to my house in College Station, and I FaceTime her again, and I'm opening the, bottle, the packaging because we're like, is this the same, like, heart-shaped crown, like, perfume bottle? We have to make sure. And so we open it, and it's this beautiful, full glass bottle of this perfume. And not only was I in awe that we had found this, but Mally, I told her a little bit of the story how God told me that there was another thing. And she was like, God had this for me today at Ross. She's like, he cared about this little bottle of perfume that's seemingly insignificant, but was close to her heart. And so now she has this brand new bottle of perfume. Um, And so a friend sees something that their friend would love and surprises them with it. And so God is that friend who remembers what we love and gives it to us. He doesn't always give it to us, and he doesn't just give it for the sake of giving it, but he gives it so that we delight more in him. So we think like, God, that you cared about this. Why would you give this to me? And then you begin to wonder about who he is, that he must care about the deep things in your heart, even the silly things in your heart. And so God wants us to delight in him, and he's given us wonderful things so that we'll delight in him more. So another really thing, important thing about wonder is that number four, wonder is for everyone. It's not reserved for like a minister or a super Christian or a minister's little sister. It's for everyone. And Matthew 18, three says, and truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven unless you turn and become like children. So think of the things that are wonderful about children, like the way they see the world with such purity of heart and with such innocence and trust. They look at things with such like admiration, even the smallest thing. And (laughs) another kind of silly story, but so my dad, when I was a kid, my dad was my hero. He still is my hero, but extra, extra my hero. And he would do this trick where, okay, I'm gonna try to do it for you guys with the microphone but he would do this trick where he put his thumb under here and this one here and then he'd like get super into it and he'd be like 
it, like pretend like he was ripping it off. And for some reason, I must have not been very bright as a kid, but for some reason, <laughs> I thought it was so cool. I was like, oh my goodness, like my dad is so cool. And my friends would come over and I'd be like, look what my dad can do. Like, look at this cool trick. And I knew it wasn't like real, but I couldn't figure out why it wasn't real. And, <laughs> but so <laughs> this trick that he did, like, <laughs> I wasn't in wonder of the trick. It was cool, but it made me more in wonder of him. Like, I was like, man, I was like, my dad, he's cool. He's my hero. Look at what he can do. And the wonder I had towards him made me love him more because I knew what was in his heart. I knew that he wanted to laugh with me and be silly with me and, like, play tricks in, like, a fun kind of way that would, like, bring out admiration, of, like, of, from me towards him. And... It's the same with God. There's an innocent trust in our wonder towards him. He does something towards you and you're like, wow, like God, that's what you're like? Like, no way. And so God says we, no matter our age, must become like children and have an innocent sense of wonder towards him. And so I tell these like funny stories, the like silly kind of average stories to show that like the wonder of God exists in regular life. It's not reserved for when someone like gets right with God or gets filled with the Holy Spirit or like those things are wonderful and have struck wonder in my heart. But even apart from that in my daily life, my daily abiding, God is a part of it all. He's a part of every little piece of my life and he cares about it. Not just when I'm like in church or just when I'm like out doing things that seem like I'm serving him directly. But in my daily life, if I keep my mind attentive towards the Lord, he's there with me and he cares about it and he brings wonder in my heart. And so the stories are to show that no matter what's happening in your life, there's something in there that can bring wonder towards God. There's something in your life that can bring wonder towards the Lord. And so wonder is not limited to a certain type of person or anyone. It's because we've all experienced wonder at some point in our lives, whether it be when you had a child or when you got married or when you saw the most incredible sunset you've always, ever seen. We've all experienced wonder at some point. And it's because... Wonder itself comes from God, and it's intended to point us back to him. And so wonder is a gift from the Lord to keep us in relationship with him and to keep us in awe of who he is because he reveals who he is. And so I really believe that all God has given you can be used to bring a sense of wonder to who he is, that all he has given you can be used. And so and it just has to start with gratitude of like, I could have gone to Ross and happened to see that perfume and been like, whoa, I'm the best sister ever. Like, I found this. Like, but no, it was the Lord. And I knew it was the Lord. And so we have to give, I hate to say it this way, but give credit where credit is due. Like God is worthy of our gratitude. And <laughs> let's see, Lord. God is worthy of our gratitude. And so we're not in wonder of God because we have to. You can't force wonder out of someone. That can't be forced out of your heart towards someone. But wonder is something that is placed in you and is a response to what something or who someone is. And so, I just feel like I need to say, God help me. <laughs> I just feel like I need to say that God, because of who he is, he's worthy of our of our praise and our worship and our wonder. And so even when we're not in relationship with him, like he cares about the things of our heart and he still cares about you. He cares about you even when we're not in relationship with him. And he's given the world to us as a way to spark wonder, to point us back to him as a tool to be like, there is a God of the universe who cares about me, who's personal. And so wonder can't be forced but it is meant for everyone as a way to make you turn back to the Lord. And so the Lord wants to be in relationship with everyone here. And he wants you to have an exciting relationship just because of who he is, an exciting relationship with him. And he wants you, he wants your heart. And if you give him your heart with a childlike innocence and purity and trust that he's gonna take care of it, then he'll bring wonder into your life because of who he is. And so that kind of, that leads me into the next point. And um, the man can come back up as I go through this point and kind of some other stuff, but wonder never has to end. Wonder never has to end. 
So it's not something we experience one time and then it goes away forever and we just have to cling to that, where you're like, this is all I have to hold on to for God for the rest of my life. <laughs> That's not true. Um, it never has to end. And so I'm going to read two verses and I'll explain what I mean by them. But Hebrews 9:27, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And Revelation 21:27. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. And so if we aren't full of wonder and love for God now, it won't just magically appear in heaven. It won't just magically come because only what is good and holy and pure in us will make it. And there's this old revivalist who I'm sure many of you have heard about, but his name is Keith Green. And he wrote this article called, Will You Be Bored in Heaven? And... I recommend you go home and read this article because it really changed the way I think about God. And in this article, he says, there is no sanctification in the grave. And he says, if you don't start working on a relationship with God now, if you start, don't start learning how to be in love with him now, why would that be any different in heaven? It won't just magically change, but it, it's because the things that you've cultivated now in a love life with Jesus that will last forever. That's what's going to last forever. And they'll grow in heaven. They'll grow there, but they have to be started now. And wonder starts now with God in your daily abiding, in your personal relationship with God, just looking around at life. And it never has to end. And it never has to end because there are unlimited things to learn about God. There are unlimited things to, for God to reveal about himself to you. And heaven will never become boring because we'll continually be brought into a deeper revelation of who God is. We'll continually be brought into a deeper revelation. And so like, you'll learn one thing about God and you'll be in awe and you'll like, learn a little more. And then all of a sudden God will give you a new revelation and you'll just keep learning about him and keep being with him forever. And that's the most exciting thought that we will be with God forever. And you were made to live forever. God made you in his image and he made you to live forever but you can but you have to surrender your life with God to be with him forever and we don't want to be separated from God and heaven is meant even in and of, it, in and of itself to strike wonder in our heart towards God who would make us to live forever because he wants to be with you forever he didn't just, didn't just do that by chance or by some thought but he did it because he would want to be with you forever and so God wants to be in relationship with you forever which is which is wild. Even when we've like, hurt him or been wrong, he always just says, come back to me. Come back to me and I'll be with you forever. And so wonder never has to end because we were made to live forever. And so living in wonder of the Lord daily isn't just some nice idea, some like make up fantasy land for a young, maybe naive girl. <laughs> like it's not just that. It's the reality of being in relationship with the living God, of living in a world where God is active and alive and he works and he moves and he cares about what's happening. And I think sometimes we don't attribute enough to God. Like he does a lot in the world and he's active and involved and he speaks. And so living in wonder of him, living in wonder of that reality, like isn't just some fantasy, it is reality. And the more you get to know God, and the more you become like him, that's the more real you become. Like, I really feel like I've had to learn that. Like, I've had to learn that sin isn't normal. All of this stuff isn't normal. This isn't even in my notes, but I'm just gonna say, sin isn't normal. And the world has created a culture that tells us like a certain way of living is right, but it's not. The way of the Bible, the way that God has created and intended for man to live, that is normal. Living with God in an exciting relationship is normal. And so it's a good thing to be in relationship with Jesus, a good thing, a freeing thing. And people think a lot that when you have like rules or holiness, all that, all that sort of stuff that it's forced, but it's not. It's because you're in wonder of who God is and you trust him. You're like, I trust God to tell me how to live my life that it's best and so you do it because you love him and then when you do it you learn that it is best and you're like God I'm so glad that I trusted you because this is best living this way 
is best. And so being in relationship with God like, is a wonderful adventure that is meant to make you more as you are intended to be, to make you more like you are intended to be. And so the world has created a culture that isn't normal. It's told you that sin is normal, but it's not. And so I just need to make it clear that that relationship with God in fresh wonder, in fresh like holiness and continual following, that's normal. That's what life was intended to be. And it's the most freeing and exciting life you could experience. And so if you don't feel wonder towards the Lord, if you like look at certain things and it doesn't direct wonder towards God, there's something that's probably keeping you from him. There's probably something in your life that is keeping you from God. Whether it be pride that says, I don't need God, or whether it be a wrong idea about who God is, or selfishness, or even just a lack of relationship with God. There's something that's keeping you from the Lord, but he's extending a hand of friendship, saying, I want to be in relationship with you. And so I kind of have two calls for this. And the first one is that this message isn't just for believers. It's not for someone who's right with God or just for someone who's right with God, but also for someone who doesn't have a relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship with God, he's inviting you into a real and powerful relationship with him. One that's worth having, the most important relationship of your life. <laughs> and so I just want to encourage you to look around at your life and pick one thing that's good about it. May it be a family member or something you really like to do and attribute it to God. Say thank you to God for giving that, that even when you weren't following him, he took care of you. Even when you weren't following him, he still made sure you had a way to look to him, that he's given you things in your life that were meant to spark wonder about who God was. And once you start realizing that it's us who's hurt God, hurt God and him who is innocent, you'll begin to realize that like, God is worth being in relationship with. And so God wants to be in relationship with you. And so if we'll just close our eyes and bow our heads and just start to pray and just ask the Lord if there's anything in our life that is, that's keeping us from God. And if you're not in relationship with him, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. And I just wanna say, Giving your life to Jesus is the most wonderful thing that you could do. The most wonderful thing that you could do. And so, if you want to give your heart to God and you know that you're not right with Him, but you want to be, I just want to encourage you to raise your hand right now and make a public declaration that I want to be right with God and I want to know God personally because He wants to know you personally and He wants to be with you. And so if there's anyone, I just want to give you the opportunity to get right with God now. we love you and we want to follow you God we thank you that you care for us and you want to be in relationship with us and Lord we know that you are worth following and the more we learn about you the more we want to learn about you and so Jesus I just pray that you would do something fresh and new in our hearts and that you would show us things that are keeping us from you we love you Lord so you can open your eyes but the next thing that I feel like the Lord wants us to pray for is that if you need a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit, we'll give them time to open up the altars. Um, so if you need a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit, if you're feeling dry or separated from him, or you even need to like ask the Lord to spark a sense of wonder in your life, if you want that, when the time comes, come down to the altar and we'll have a few of us standing up and ready to pray for people if you'd like it. And so you can come and ask for prayer. Um, from me or Pastor Pat, um, or if a deacon wants to come up or two. Um, and so if you need a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit, I just want to encourage you to come down as the band plays a song in a second and, and just believe that the Holy Spirit will touch you new and fresh. And then as we come down, if, 
if you wanted to give your heart to the Lord but didn't, I just want you to come find me because the opportunity is still open.